now. All right. Dr. Trish uh, Lay, did I get yeah. your last name right? Lay? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why. Part of me wanted to say Lee, but I like that's not right. Okay. It, yeah. It's Lee is right, actually, but I prefer it more like Lay. But okay. Well, Dr. Awesome. Lay, thank yeah. you for coming on to the Social League podcast. I'm excited yeah. for this conversation. I know a bunch of people, especially in my generation, Gen Z and millennials, mm-hmm. know that this conversation is one that needs to take place, even <laughs> though it's a very taboo subject. And it's on the topic of porn addiction. Yes. And when people hear that, you know, I have no friends who have struggled with a sort of addiction in that realm. And like, mm-hmm. I think one of the first things I noticed is that it's hard to admit to yourself because it's been culturally accepted, especially growing up. It's like, oh, do you watch porn? Yeah, of course I watch porn. Like, come on, bro. Like, of course. Like, yeah, I get it off that way. It's like kind of that lingual kind of language we tell ourselves to mm-hmm. internalize that it's okay. And unfortunately we're starting to find that people are doing it younger and younger and i know people oh, yeah. up people as young as eight seven years old who seven are, and eight year olds are addicted to porn for which sure. is which is which blows my mind because mm-hmm. it's all because we have a device like this it and is. a smartphone where you can go onto safari and literally look up anything where you can literally tap your button and you look up naked women boom all these porn sites will come up and you can be like oh what is this and you know as we are we are curious creatures we're going to press and we're going to select that. And then, yeah. you know, we're going to have these internal responses where we're going to feel aroused and we're going to start producing dopamine, serotonin, and all these neurochemicals where we're going to be like, wow, I like this feeling. Let me continue this. This could be part of a ritual. And before you know it, you're 30 years old, you're dealing with an addiction where you can't stop it. It's affecting your relationship with your partner. It's actually affecting your career. And on top of that, it's led to this it's it's led to almost a disability in the sense where you can't get anything else done because it's constantly on your mind and it's a distraction Mm -hmm. and knowing who Mm -hmm. we are now we don't see the delayed gratification or the long-term side effects of things like right now we think it's okay and it's terrifying and i'm starting to know more and more people who are struggling with this and it even leads to issues in the bedroom when you're trying to have sexual interaction and you're thinking of something that's unattainable and is staged and with these people that have these perfect model like bodies and you're trying to implement that into your emotional sexual interaction which is far from possible so it's leading to a lot of downstream effects sorry for that whole long intro but oh i mean you nailed it man you totally nailed everything that is going on that people don't know until they're in it and that is the terrifying part is that you know that is I was starting to take a couple notes because I can literally comment on each piece that you said for like a half hour, which I won't, (laughs) but you know, like you nailed that for sure. Yeah. And I think a good place to start is like, when did this become something prevalent to even go into and study into? Because, you know, people will look at Playboy magazines or look at whatever and, you know, get off from that. But they knew that if they had that picture or whatever it is, they could walk away from it. It's not like they could have access to it. Now it's like, you could be at the workplace, you could be at school, you can be at all these places and by tap of button, you could be there. Yeah, totally. And you're right. So it really became problematic with internet pornography use. Then as phones became more prevalent and then as, you know, if you ever saw the movie Pretty Woman, Richard Gere's in it, he's got a cell phone, the thing's like this big, but you know, like, and he's the only one who had it because he was rich. But so now that cell phones are in everybody's pocket, I always say now everybody has porn in their pocket and porn in the pocket is really the most devastating piece, which is why things are getting worse rapidly in this department, because now kids have porn in their pocket in cafeterias in school. And I know there's a lot of kids who are doing it. I talk to business people who they're like, I didn't know it was bad for me. Like I literally watch it in the cab between meetings, you know, in New York City because people don't know that it's bad for them and it is the way they relax. And we know from the science that the number one utility of porn is stress relief. Mm-hmm. Number two, boredom. It's for mood regulation to, to make you feel better about you know, your circumstances in life. And we can dig into that, but it really has become a problem in the you know, last 10 years because it's showing up in everybody's pocket and not only searching for it, it's being served up to seven-year-olds. Like seven-year-olds aren't looking for it. And you know how the internet works. 
like I'll put in, I'm surprised how little it pops up for me because of what I do, but you know, I'll put in things I didn't even think I was going to get images and I get some weird site. And then, so kids see it and then their brains are literally hijacked. And what the science shows, and this is what makes porn different from alcohol yeah. or drugs is it's served up to your seven-year-old while they're in their room doing their, you know, their English language arts homework Playing with Barbies or toys. Yeah, totally. And then it's served up to them and it is a neurochemical response. That's why I said you, you nailed it because for a lot of people, you know, I talked to a lot of people have this problem for a lot of people. They're like, I didn't even like what I saw, but it made my brain feel so good. And they're like, I just needed more of it. Like I was kind of freaked out by it, but it made me feel so good. I'm like, I couldn't. And that's that rush of dopamine in the person's brain. And so it hijacks the brain. And what I was starting to say is that science shows the younger that the brain has that response, the more it's hooked. So like if you're exposed to porn when you're seven, opposed to 15, the likelihood that you develop an addiction is obviously earlier and then higher, but most brains have that response. It's like the 1% brain that doesn't have that response, just like it's the 1% that if you drink a lot, you're not going to fall into alcohol misuse. And it's the subtleness about it, which gets me is because when you're doing porn versus let's say a drug, a drug, you know, it has, it feels good, but you know, afterwards it's, you feel horrible. You feel yeah. bad. You know, it's affecting where porn, it's like, you can do it and quickly reintegrate. You're not having yeah, some- for, like a while, for a while, because then people tip into, and this is one of the notes I wrote for myself, is that the reason your life no longer does it for you is because I call it a dopamine deluge. Deluge means flood. Yeah. So you get a flood of dopamine from the screen when you watch porn, especially if it's frequent, consistent, and with increasing levels of intensity, which is a tolerance thing, escalation. So what happens is it creates a dopamine deficit in your life. Mm. There, and you already, you know, you already said it, that there's no way you can get that amount of dopamine from your partner. Your work, work, if you love your work, you should be getting smaller amounts of dopamine. So you go to work and yeah, it's work. But, you know, if you like your work, you're psyched because you're getting your good work done. But if your brain's trained to go into porn for dopamine, your brain learns there's nowhere near the amount of dopamine I can get from the world. I can't get it from work. I can't get it from my friends. I can't get it from my girlfriend. So it pushes the brain back into porn over and over and over. So what happens is there's a cycle to this for everybody. Yeah. So what happens is you'll hit a dopamine deficit in your life. And, and that's why people will have the urge and their brain will go, huh? And I think I watched some porn, but it's because like, you should be able to get through a couple hours of work without the urge. And when people hit a certain tipping point of tolerance and escalation, they can no longer get three hours of work done. They, they need a hit of porn in the middle of it to get enough dopamine to keep doing the work. So before you know it, they're unmotivated. People get fired for watching porn at work. And people, you know, I talk to so many people, they're like, I literally can't do my work. People have to have it simultaneously on another screen to get the dopamine. And what it's going to do to the world in terms of all the stuff you began to mention is truly devastating for men too. So like, you know, I got an email yesterday from a hater. <laughs> and I haven't gotten a hater email in a while, but all it said was like, I saw one of your videos, how you ever became a doctor is beyond me. That's all it said. But like, and obviously I made that person upset because the message is you can't keep doing this and sustain it without it having negative effects. And that's the truth. And it's potential, I bet that person and many people, it's the sinking feeling where what you're saying in these YouTube videos, it resonates with them. Yeah. The fact that it's like, oh my God, I am doing that. I'm doing that for a very long time. That's it not is. Good. And it's the people who, you know, I were, you know, and actually some, lot, some of the haters have emailed me back later and they're like, sorry about that hater email. I just really was upset by your message. And I know that the people who are the most upset are the ones who need it the most. But, and you know, the, the negative ripple effect is, there's books out and there's studies that show less men are getting into college than ever before. Less men are completing college. Less men are able to get the jobs that they want. Less men are staying in the jobs that they want. Like this is going to hit catastrophic levels is, for men. And is that data purely correlated to porn addiction or are there multiple variables to that? Well, the science on porn, and, and I wanted to back up to this for a second. So, you know, I use the word addiction because... I want people to know this is very addictive, but mm -hmm. most of the science calls it problematic porn use, PPU. Mm. 
So any addiction or any misuse of any substance or behavior, um, but you know, I think porn's the most devastating, is exists on a continuum. So you know, you can have healthy use. You know, I don't think you can with porn, but with alcohol, you can have healthy use. Some people don't think you can with alcohol, but then it's misuse, then it's abuse, then it's addiction and compulsion. So the compulsion is, you know, people say to me, how do I know if I have a porn addiction? I say, try to stop. If you can stop by yourself, no problem and, and never go back, you don't have an addiction. But very quickly, most people realize they can't even go a day. They can't go two days. They can never go a week. If they go a month, they're white knuckling it the whole time. And this is one of the distinctions I do want to make, which I think is important, is the difference between being addicted to porn and then masturbation. Because I know people, you know, masturbate, but aren't watching porn. And I don't know if I, to me, I don't know if that's necessarily bad. And I know people who are watching porn are, and, you know, they masturbate. Yeah. That could be incredibly bad. So can you dis- dis- discuss the differences there? A- absolutely. And it's a great differentiation to make. And I will comment on YouTube a lot with this differentiation. I've made a couple of videos, but it's a slippery slope too, because this is, this is the deal. If you've ever watched porn with any consistency and frequency, and usually people masturbate when they watch porn, you've linked those two behaviors. So the dopamine release from this high level of arousal in mental, visual, and physical stimulation, like you've taught your brain, it needs massive amount of arousal to be able to get there. If you've never watched porn and you've developed a quote unquote healthy masturbation habit, which is, you know, you stay in your body, you're not going to fantasy, you're, it's, it's a, it's actually like a self connecting to one's self experience. If you've developed that type of habit, which is nearly nobody, by the way, if you've developed that type of habit, then that's a healthy masturbation habit. But if you've been watching porn and masturbating and you want to transition to a healthy masturbation habit, most people not going to happen because their brain has had that dopamine flood from the high levels of stimulation. And so a lot of people say, you know, I talk to people about this all day, every day, and especially masturbation. So like a lot of people say, like, what's the point? Like, if I'm not going to do fantasy and if I'm not going to at least use the internalized images and, you know, a lot of physical stimulation, what's the point? And that is the point that if you don't see any point in that, it's not giving you the arousal you need. So like example being like, let's say I, I'm not watching porn, but instead what I'm doing is I'm creating a story. I'm creating quote unquote, a fantasy in my head. And that's how I get off that itself. Is that still considered an addiction, a weight, a, to- a weight route towards addiction? Or could that be being like, Oh, like I'm having thoughts of this girl that I saw today, you know, do that. That's my relaxation. Yeah. And, and the thing is like, you still don't want to do that because what you're doing is you're coupling your brain and you cut, when I say couple your brain, you're doing it through dopamine, lower levels of serotonin and oxytocin. Oxytocin is a neurotransmitter that literally couples people neurologically. Yeah. So if you constantly fantasize, you're coupling your brain to sex, to yourself. Like, why would you ever want to do that? You're, you'd be coupling yourself to fantasy and yourself. So, but one more thing is like, if it comes out of a porn habit, that fantasy, then likely it's not healthy fantasy. And so some people can pull off healthy fantasy, like foreplay, you know, like you're fantasizing about the sex you're about to have and it's getting you aroused, but it's never going to get you like to 300% aroused. It's going to get you to the hundred percent aroused that is healthy in a healthy sexual experience but you're still coupling your brain to yourself. Mm. And could the same be said, because I know this is a popular route that I've heard some people talk about is even literature, reading stuff, or even seeing drawings, cartoons, are those routes as well? Is that also coupling that can be negative? Definitely. But at lower levels than high speed internet porn, where you've got just, you can open up as many tabs as you want and you can go through 50, 60, you know, people will, will, you know, just think about the, and we can probably digress into a social media example yeah. in a minute, but like thinking about how quickly the brain has to respond to all this high level stimulation in the internet. That's a diff, that is different than if you read a, you know, something sexy. 50 shades of gray. Arousing. You're reading 50 <laughs> shades of gray. Like, you know, it's meant to be arousing, but it's using your imagination to create that arousal. 
it's not giving you this super normal stimulus that's on steroids that's producing all this dopamine because it's the dopamine blood or deluge that yeah. damages the brain. So when, when your brain gets all this dopamine fast and hard, and then especially consistently, frequently, and with escalation, it knocks out the frontal lobe. Science shows that structurally it'll knock out cells and especially functionally, it takes out the frontal lobe, which we need for executive decision, for decision-making, for to be able to pump the brakes on impulsive and compulsive behaviors, like thinking, memory, yeah. attention, motivation, it's all, socialization, it's all up there. And that's connected to the reward center. So just one more thing about this is that Please. then the reward center is in the midbrain and in the midbrain, it's desensitizing the cells. So mm. that's why when you go back and you watch the thing you watched a month ago and it doesn't do it for you anymore, you've literally fried the reward center. So it needs more stimulation. So you move on yeah. to get the same response. And as you're doing that, it's just like you're hammering away on your brain. And, and I've heard they, of, you can't think. And then yeah, nothing I've, does it for you anymore. I've heard of many people um, discussing how when they're introduced to porn, it's very, you know, simple, just basic sex and how it gets more extreme. And like they have the data Pornhub releases and I see it for comical reasons, but like rape porn is incredibly popular among people. I look and at it too. I agreed. And that's why it's increasing sexual violence. I read the research too. I go on truth about porn all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a nonprofit that puts out media and research. You know, there's a new study on sexual choking, like shock me, shock me, sexual choking's up. <laughs> and yeah. like, you know, men think sexual choking is okay. And they think women like it. And unfortunately, women are being taught to like it. So like now, you know, what you see in the screen comes out. And like you said, people will try to enact it in the bedroom. And I just made two videos a week or two ago because people say to me all the time, I wouldn't have to watch porn if my wife would have more sex with me or crazier sex with me. But mm -hmm. you already said it. The bar is set so high from porn that, that we know also from science the, the five most common acts in porn, not even crazy ones, just the most common acts, and I can try to think of them in a minute, they, there's another study that shows women don't actually like any of them. <laughs> so like real women don't like the stuff men are watching in porn. And then men yeah. go in the bedroom like, honey, let's try this. And early in a relationship, a lot of women will try to please their man and do those things, but it's not sustainable because it's not something they actually enjoy. Yeah, the translating that from the porn into the bedroom is definitely controversial. And I think to me, it's like I start thinking like going back like evolution, just how like I think like the original homo sapiens, I wouldn't say they were gentle with each other. Like I wouldn't imagine <laughs> that. I bet they were still very, very violent and maybe at times extreme where obviously they pillage and you have Genghis Kong and all those people. Yeah, yeah. Well, but those, also, are the those are honestly, those are the unhealthy sexual people. There's healthy sexual people back there, but a word I like to use is erotic. Like mm -hmm. you get funky in the bedroom if you want, but that's eroticism. So like I tell people all the time, cause they're like, you know, this lady is preaching no sex. I'm like, watch a video. I'm preaching tons of the funkiest sex. That's still good for two people. And you know, as much as you want, but it's different because you have to shift out of this hypersexual space, communicate with your partner. Your partner should be enjoying what's going on. That's the reality. So that's connective sex, but it's not like, but I know what you're saying. Like Genghis Khan, I doubt was a playful mate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, I try to see, I'm trying to leveling the playing field just because I, I hate the idea that this is all like, you know, there is definitely a lot of nuance and like new things happening today. But also, this is something that's historically been something that's happened, you know, the mistreatment of women, obviously, in the past. So, you know, not saying that should be happening now, but there is some level of that, I bet, like, coded in our gene at this point where we've evolved from, where I bet it does lead to the arousal and the release of oxytocin in some women. Yeah, but the difference is, this is the difference, is that, you know, historically speaking, rape wasn't thought of as something that was arousing you know what I mean? Like if you weren't watching mm. rape type of porn mm. and you found out your friend raped someone, mm -hmm. you'd be like, so not cool. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So now this is, and this is why I started making videos because my heart feels for the men 
who get themselves into this position on accident and they don't even know they're doing it, porn is making them do it. When you watch the sexual violence in porn, your brain wants to do it in real life, especially if you keep going with intensity. At a certain point, videos no longer do it for you. And that, that's why I call it the hijacker, because the hijacker goes, this is boring. Let's go get some of this in real life. So some people will move on to webcam sex. Some people will move on to prostitutes. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people now move on to dating apps. And you know, if you can get on a dating app and you can get some girl to come over to have sex with you, that's not a healthy partner. You're likely going to be, be able to do whatever thing you just saw and you want to do with a human being. That's what people are using dating apps for. So then, like I just made a video about James Franco, who I actually like a lot as an actor, you know, he had those sexual allegations for sexually mistreating sexual misconduct. He cost him $2.2 million, which actually was very low for what he had going on. He started a film school, started a course called Sex Scenes and Acting, and they got all these women to do you know, multiple partner funky scenes in the name of filmmaking. And then of course there's a class action lawsuit against him, but it came out saying, I have a sex addiction and I've been working on it. But he said he had a sex addiction for 20 years, but in between that, he did porn research for the show, The Deuce, where he was making porn scenes. Like it's in his brain all the time. So then then he thinks I got a great idea. Let's make a sex scene class. It's not a great idea at all. So those ideas that the hijacker brings in to keep the thing going gets people in jail. Like if you watch kitty porn and it's, it's you're one click away from possible jail. You watch it and you download it, literally you're one click away. To me, I'm extremely pessimistic about this because I just feel like, I don't know what the data is about the amount of people that are hooked on porn and how much of it is honest reviews of people saying they are because most people are probably not going to admit it. But yeah. especially the generation now, Gen Z, what they're going into, I can't think of a single person that doesn't watch porn. And if, if, I, ha- if I do know someone, they probably live in a cave and they came out of the cave last year or a couple months ago. Totally. So it's, and, and it's the same for me. I, I have five teenagers. I don't know if you know that about me. So, no. you know, about the discussions of porn and sex. And, you know, it's weird for me because I didn't care about porn till 10 years ago when someone I care about a lot figured out they watch porn. It was creating problems. Then it started to trash their entire life. And I, being a cognitive neuroscientist, I read the brain stuff. I'm like, oh my God, this is the worst thing coming at us. So like before that, I didn't care about porn at all. And I I never thought about it, honestly. And, you know, now I talk to my teenagers. And so like, you know, I know all my teenagers don't know one person who don't, who doesn't watch porn. And I'm like, you're going to be the one person. And then my son came home and he's like talking about hanging out with his friends. And he, he joked that he was blocked out of Tinder because of trying to create the account when he was 12 or something. He's going to be 18. Uh, I go, dude, what are you talking about? Tinder account. We talk about porn a lot frequently, but he never made the connection between how bad Tinder is. So I'm like, dude, you cannot go on Tinder. Like does the similar things, you know, he, he's hanging out with those dudes are all on Tinder, you know? Well, that, that's the difficult thing. And like, I don't know if I want to defend Tinder or not, but like <laughs> the culture now, it's, I know seems... the science about Tinder, so you can oh, defend perfect, and I can perfect, counter. Perfect, perfect, perfect. I would, I appreciate that. Please counter because I know people listening. Tinder is very commonplace. It's you know, mm-hmm. if you go to college, I, I, I didn't realize high school was that big, but in college for sure, you know, everyone has it, and it's so just... bad for people. It's so bad for men. Yeah, and I can well, tell you why. Yes, please tell me why because from what I see it, I just see it as the exchange where. The idea, I know it's going to inhibit the idea of what a relationship is for these people, but what if the cognitive idea of what they have of Tinder is, look, I don't want to have anything serious. And I know this is kind of going into what a relationship is and like Mm -hmm. defining that and we can go Mm -hmm. into that, Mm -hmm. but it's like, okay, for this period of time, maybe I'm focused on my goals and my career and my passion and introducing a mate at this time in my life is going to actually be difficult to manage. But I also want to have that release of dopamine. I want to be able to have that sexual interaction. Mm -hmm. And to me, maybe Tinder could be a solution where I could find an individual. I can, we could be partners, but it's agreed upon. There's complete transparency. That's rare, but complete transparency Mm -hmm. where, okay, this is just going to be something where we're both getting to exchange something, Mm -hmm. but we're not going to tie in the emotion. We're not going to try to tie 
in the love, but it's going to be something so we can use this as a tool of relaxation and also stress feet and also build confidence in each other, make each mm -hmm. other feel better about ourselves and feel good about our bodies. But it won't go any further from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a unicorn, right? <laughs> That's a unicorn with some rainbow wings, probably. But we can, I can break that down in a second. First, let me tell you what my biggest concern about Tinder based on the science is, yeah. is that it's destroying people's self-esteem. So it's doing the opposite of what you are sharing. And we know this from science and especially young men. And this is the conversation that I had with Declan, my son, when, when he's like, oh, Tinder's not that bad. I'm like, it is. And the reason yeah. it is, is because when you go on there and you compare yourself to other people, you can never measure up because of what you just said. P people's bars now are being set in different ways than ever before. And it's mostly mm -hmm. physicality. Mm -hmm. not mental or emotional connection. And we need yep. to get back to the idea of connection, maybe not love, but connection. Mm -hmm. So we know that it's trashing people's self-esteem. They look at other people and they basically always think they don't measure up and it creates this bar. And porn does that. Porn's been shown to create, and I know this from talking to people too, like in the challenges that they have, it makes men not like their bodies as much it makes men think they have small penises. Like, and this is, Dad and I had this conversation another day ago <laughs> because of, oh, it doesn't matter, teenage stuff he was saying. I'm like, dude, you got to bring the hypersexuality down. With all this, you know, he's like, okay. You know, and I'm glad he does it in front of me because it's better than I'm not. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, but it's also a reflection of what he's thinking about because he's discussing it. Like, you know, about how big everybody is. I'm like, you don't have to be big. You have to, not be small, I said, <laughs> which, you know, science shows is very few people. have. There are people with micro penises. There's, there, yeah. there's, yeah. There's, there's, there's not a lot of them. Shit. Most people are in that, you know, within normal limits range and to the, to the big range. But what, the point what is, it? is, is it like what, four flaccid, like four or five, something like that? Yeah. Like, I forget the numbers, but it's in like the five, five, okay. you know, like on average. Yeah. And, you know, if you watch porn, it's in the 10. So, you know, yeah. it, so it's just not a, it makes you feel bad about yourself. So, you know, people always comment too about how they'll go on Tinder and they won't be able to find someone. So now it's creating this whole alpha male, uh, you know, beta. It's creating this like lesser than when it's not creating that more than. And the point too about Tinder is if you're on there and someone's willing to run over, that's not a healthy person. So you end up in a healthy you know, if you don't want to call it relationship, but if even in what you're describing is a relationship, not a traditional one, but, you know, if it's an agreement on this thing we're going to do, you know, it's a, some type of relationship, it's a person who's not healthy because that person doesn't take into account the mental and emotional connection, which that's actually what people want. So like to say, we're going to do this thing and have no emotional and mental commitment in it that's the opposite of what people are actually looking for. Like, you know, the physicality and the dopamine hit in that becomes what your brain is trained to go after, but it's not actually the driving force. People want connection with other people. They want that person to see them as a whole person and to enjoy their time with them. And, you know, not just someone you call up for a booty call. Exactly. And I agree all of that. The thing is the sentiment that I've noticed is for people my age and even high schoolers, mm -hmm. this emotional and deeper connection, mm -hmm. the maturity isn't quite there yet on both ends. I, I, I notice where a lot of people like hookup culture in college is incredibly popular. It's very fun. It's like, totally. oh, that person's attractive. Let's get with her or that guy's attractive. Let's get with him. And it's Absolutely. something that that's something that is pro starts to get programmed within us where we start thinking like, oh my God, it is about the look. It is about having a giant penis and, and having that's the my abs point. and the big body. And when it comes to it, and like, I've told myself this many times, and when I talk to my friends, talk about this, where it's like, look, you can be in that relationship, you can be that alpha male. But if you can't have a conversation with the other partner, if you can't connect, you can't get vulnerable, if you can't express your ideas, if you have no drive towards a goal or idea of how you feel or philosophize about the world, that relationship is temporary. And that relationship is usually going to be falling apart because you can't connect. However, that whole thing that I just said, 
mm-hmm. people usually don't even go there, you know, right away. It's usually just be like, oh, physicality, you look great. Let's do this. We're having fun. All right, awesome. Let's not include the emotion. But as I've gotten older and like, I'm just turning 22 at the end of this month, but yeah, I'm cool. noticing more and more people where it's like, yeah, at first there is that love phase. There is that where you're close, you're interacting, where you're like, oh, I want to see them all the time. I want to have sexual intercourse with them. Mm-hmm. And people don't realize it. Maybe it's because of social media where there's a lack of relationships taking place now where people don't notice that that phase ended, ends. That's the psychology about it. The honeymoon phase will end. And when it mm-hmm. does, you're going to see each other and you can make that decision being like, I find that other person attractive and I'll rather go with them. Or you can be smart and realize this will repeat again and it will keep repeating. I keep just moving on and moving on, moving on, moving on, and you'll never end up happy. So you have to tell yourself that, okay, what are the deeper qualities? What are the deeper values we share that we can connect with, that we can grow with? And I think that's because people now feel fear like, oh, if someone likes my partner or I like someone else, is that an indication that maybe I'm not into this relationship anymore? And it's all this confusion because you mix that with the porn, you mix that with constantly seeing women as this way and your curating of the world. There's this lost idea of how a relationship is supposed to be or how it's supposed to function. And I'm starting to realize more people are figuring this out later, later in their 20s, and maybe not even then, maybe their early 30s. When it's almost like, oh my God, that person I liked before, like I only cared about their body. I really didn't care about, you know? And it's like, how do you instigate that? How do you get that going where it's like you're thinking at age 18 with your son Decker there being like, hey, it's not about the physicality. Yeah, at first you probably want to have some sort of physicality to just, you know. I I think you always do actually, but it's only a piece. And I mean, you nailed it on the head uh, straight through again. So I got to tell you, if you haven't read about this stuff, your pulse is completely right on all of it. And before I kind of comment on some of those things, where does all that come from? It's the seeds. So what seeds are planted in a kiddo's brain? And we could just go back to, you know, if you get your phone and you're trolling through Instagram and you're just checking out people scantily clad and you're getting little dopamine hits from just cruising through, looking at people's physical beings without ever contemplating So the seeds are planted. And right now we know going back to the seven to eight year old exposure on phones of sexual content, seeds are being planted in childhood. So 50 years ago, seeds were planted in adolescence and in early adulthood, those seeds are being planted. And you've probably heard the saying of, you know, if there's two wolves inside of you and they're fighting, which wolf wins? You know, Mm. it's longer than that. If you look it up, it's a very cool uh, I don't know, adage, the two yeah. words. And the answer is the one you feed. So mm. like if, you know, my my son, my daughter, they go to the same high school. She's a year younger. She said that they had to go to this, I don't know, thing in the auditorium. And she's sitting there and my son walks in with like seven girls because this is what he does. Player. He's crunching on this one girl. Yeah, exactly. He's crunching on this one girl. And so, you know, um, and he always has had a lot of friends that are girls. But so I talked to him and I, I said like, what's going on, man? I know like, you know, playing the field is cool, but he wants to be with this girl, but it's, it has a hang up. So because it has a hang up, he's doing this field thing. He actually doesn't want to do the field thing. He wants the, the one girl for that to grow, but it's stagnated. So like, if he continues to fuel this, I have a harem thing. He will be 40 years old wanting a harem, never having the connection to the person that he either had too much fear or whatever to try to, you know, being, being let down is really a major fear for people that if they ask the one girl and that girl doesn't like them, it's difficult for them to go back towards that one person that they're actually interested in. So they convince themselves that hookup culture is the way to go. And before I move on, I just want to share that, you know, people email me and start working with me all the time because they're trying to come out of swinger culture. And that is something that's endorsed in today's media, where it's like, you know, polyamory is what it's actually called, like being in a relationship with multiple people. Generally speaking, only one person is happy. And that's a person who has, which is my next point hypersexuality behavior disorder. It's classified in the ICD-11, which is the International Classification of Diseases. So compulsive sexuality 
is now a classification. And it's exactly what you're talking about. It's objectification of people. So when you just look at people as a body for your pleasure, that is you're using that person as an object if you never connect with them on deeper levels. So we're growing up kids on accident because they're consuming pornography, which clearly, if you're just looking at other people on a screen for your pleasure, they become objects. And then it creates fetishes too, which I wanted to comment about fetishes before when we were talking about, you know, rape porn, which increases sexual violence. People will send me, you know, perceived strange, strange emails, but to me, I've gotten one for just about everything. If something that a person saw gave them that arousal and fit an emotional need, and this is the important part, there usually is an emotional need buried underneath the objectification that anything can be coupled. So the weirdest things ever get coupled for people and that become people's fetishes, but it's self-soothing and makes them feel better. And so when there's objectification, you learn just to objectify people. And so what you're talking about, there's phases of love. And, and this, is, this is shown in research. The first phase of love is lust. So of course there should be the honeymoon phase. You are just in that lust mode. But then when the first fight comes, and you and your honey are, you know, not in a good place. Unfortunately, right now, most people run to porn because their brains are conditioned to go to porn to get a hit to be okay, accidentally coupling their brain to the screen. If you run to somebody else, you're doing, you know, not the way to move into phase two. Phase mm-hmm. two is you have a fight and you figure it out. You connect an emotional, yeah. mental, deeper, deeper level. You, you, you know, attach yourself to that person. It goes back to healthy attachment, which comes a lot from people's parents also. So then if you can move through that phase and you decide you're going to build a life together and it can look like all different things. It doesn't have to be the traditional marriage or whatever, like we perceive traditional relationships. It can be, you know, I won't use the word non-traditional, but it can be different. It can be diversified. What is a good relationship, but it should have that connection, that ability to get through difficult things together. And for that person to become your person, because people want people. They don't want just bodies. They want to have the end of the night, you come home to your person or the end of the week, you know, you come home to your person, but you have to have vulnerability and intimacy. And that's what's lacking in that formula. It, it's so, it's so true. You know, I think that's one of the things people don't realize, but it's like, we just want to feel loved and connected. I know that's so corny to say, but it's so true. End of the day, it's like, yeah, you could be the alpha. You could be slaying the game with all these women. But if none of these women appreciate or connect with you, you're going to feel very, very lonely searching for where you can get that. And yeah, very empty. It creates more emptiness. Like it's not even serving the need. It's a false need. Like it's the fake need. You know, if you go just to get with someone and hook up with someone, that's not actually the need. And then you serve it in the wrong way, which means you're literally creating neural pathways. So as a neuroscientist, I want people to know, like, if you continue to do that, ingraining into your brain that this is the way that I go to get my needs met. And then you, you tell yourself your need is sex and and you put away the fact that your need is actually love and connection, some sense of security and stability, someone who sees you for really you, you can let your hair down, you can gain five pounds, you can be angry. And that person's still going to be there for you. Abandonment's at a lot of people's core, but you're building the neural pathways if you traverse them, if you go over them over and over and over and over again, your brain's going to take that. And when I work with people, literally, we stop using that pathway. You have to stop. You can't use both pathways at the same time. You have to stop using that pathway, take the new pathway and use it 10,000 times. I, I definitely want to go into the treatment, how you do that. But before we go there, one of the things I wanted to ask, since this is your field, yeah. is your thoughts Your thoughts on the idea of are the patients you're seeing, are a lot of them tending to be more isolated or they tend to be more like alone because of social media and technology that it's becoming more and more difficult to actually have interactions that they don't want to actually approach people and potentially try to have an exchange that they'd rather result to just going on to porn and that could be their like relief is that common among that's the people pro- yeah and that's proven by science and okay. it's um anecdotally unfortunately it's happening like what science is showing is that and again going back to your point of the people who are willing to admit it which is a small percentage yeah science shows that 
more men are just going to porn and are not even trying to have sex because mm. porn creates erectile dysfunction and performance anxiety, which leads to social anxiety. So that's mm -hmm. a lot to unpack, but to quickly unpack it is if you watch porn, it creates porn induced erectile dysfunction. Do you know this? Do you know this part of? Tell me please. And it's, it's important like, also to the listeners because they probably don't know. It's off the charts. How many young men have erectile dysfunction? where even 15 years ago, erectile dysfunction was reserved for older men. Yeah. So now men, teenagers, teenagers, I work with a ton of teenagers, 20 year olds that, you know, if you've been watching porn, especially if it has intensity, even for five years, and we can talk about edging in a minute too, if you want, but a lot of people edge. So they'll like keep their brain in this dopamine deluge state, not realizing they're literally frying their brain out if they go longer and longer and longer before they orgasm. That is frying brains across the world right now and you can do that in a year i work with young people they're like i've only been watching porn for two years but i've been watching it like this hardcore lingering in that state to feel the best yeah fries the brain out and so then what happens is you get erectile dysfunction and then you can't be with a partner and it gives you so much stress and anxiety because you literally can't get aroused enough because the reward center is desensitized which leads you back to more porn because it's the only thing that can give you the arousal. Plus you, you are so stressed out about being with a person. So there's so many men out there that have never been with a woman because of that. And they don't even think they can. And that's why I say my heart breaks. Like I want to solve this for men mm -hmm. primarily, which then solves it for women, which then fixes it for kids, which then helps society. But, you know, men are like stuck in this loop where they have to go back to porn because they can't even be with a person. And it's the fear that they cannot get erected and have an ejaculation during sex. Is that yeah, also they mean can't. that- It's not just a fear. They literally can't. They can't. and Which then gives them even more fear, which becomes this feedback loop within sexual experiences, but they actually can't get an erection. And then what about pre-ejaculation? Is there any correlations with that or is that not what in the mean? discussion? For people that are having porn addiction, like is it, is there any correlation between porn addiction and people who are about to have sex and then they have quick pre-ejaculation where they can't, they just get it off so quickly? Sometimes, sometimes, okay. but that's much less common. Yeah. Okay. Delayed ejaculation is the major problem. People okay. who, uh, because usually that's the opposite. And, and that depends too, because unfortunately what a lot of people do because to solve that whole delayed ejaculation or erectile dysfunction thing, is they'll do what we were talking about. They'll masturbate before they're with their partner or they'll watch a ton of porn as a prep for being with their partner, but they don't realize they're training their brain to have to watch porn to be with their partner. And, you know, like I talked to partners too. One partner, you know, she's like, we're in the middle of getting it on basically. And he cruises out of the bedroom and he says, we'll be right back. She's like, I'm like, where'd he go? He's watching porn. Cause he yeah. can't, he can't be with her without that. And so then, so then, you know, you come back in, if you just, if you just watch porn, that would create for, you know, quick ejaculation, but that's the, that's much more rare than delayed and, and, you know, in porn, you're taught you should go forever. So people yeah. think that's cool, even though it's not how healthy sex should be. And now there's things like Roman swipes where these, like these anesthetics that they're putting on before sex, so it can numb it so they can last longer. And it's, it's, it's so funny when I see that because you know, the people that are doing this are influencers our age, and they're probably dealing with these issues or know people. And they're realizing, hey, let's just get this anesthetic that you can put on, which will make you last even longer and longer. And it's like, you know, like you said, the narrative of this is pushed away from the intimacy. And like, they're so worried of, oh, I don't want this to be a minute or two minutes. Like that's, that's too short. It needs to be like, half an hour, an hour, which I feel bad for the poor girl or the individual. Well, that, on the other that's, end. that's exactly it. Is that neither people should actually be going that long. Just men are taught by watching porn. And, you know, there's a ton of science, the science behind it is so fascinating too. Like if you just break it down and men don't understand that, if understand the things I'm about to say, if they've never been with a woman, like, you know, porn, it's actually harming women by being the way that the scenes are enacted. But, you know, they never show a woman being uncomfortable or in pain. So that's just like showing the narrative that that's fun for both. Because a lot of people reach out to me. They're like, how can what you're saying be true? And, and there's a lot of porn performers who come out now and will say like how terrible conditions are on sets. And that's exactly it. And so I, men's health and men's health a couple months ago, 
we get men's health for my husband. And, you know, I'm looking through it. Actually, I think it's good for the most part, but I was not yeah. a half camper when I saw entire page, two page spread on the future of how to figure out your, your personal man's sex life, like all terrible ideas. I try not to say any of them because people will get the ideas for me and I don't want to do that, but I'm reading this. I'm like, this is an awful solution to a problem that should be fixed in a healthy way all just band-aids for the problem that's created by the same thing. And, you know, like telling men, go do these things, you know, VR. Yeah. That's a good idea. VR. Come on. <laughs> I, I know so. it's so sad. And that's why I'm very pessimistic about it. And we can go into the treatments now, but just how I don't see this getting any better just because of the amount of information that we're given and how as a marketer, sex sells people are always going to want to put that image out there like a girl mm -hmm. is like if she just puts images of her in a turtleneck and long pants every day she won't be able to grow a following and if she I wants know. to be able to sell guess what she has to get in a bikini she has to be wearing those tight provocative clothes wow. because that's how she's going to get followers likes comments and people are going to buy and then guess what she's on only fans and she's making half a million dollars a year so it's like I, I, I hate to say it, but I just, I see, it seems so pessimistic. And that's why like what you're doing, like you're doing something that's such tremendous work where it's such an uphill battle, but we need people like you to do that. I know it's interesting. My entire professional life has basically been an uphill battle. So I'm used to it because I tend to care about the things that go against the masses. Like mm. in healthcare, my husband and I have a practice where we use all natural treatments for ADHD, attention, anxiety, all brain challenges, which we help yeah. people and they don't need drugs. So like, you know, the uphill battle against mainstream, you know, sick care actually. So I'm used to this uphill battle. So then when the porn thing fell in my lap, I'm like, porn, seriously, could you get a bigger uphill battle, especially yeah. as a middle-aged woman? But I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I'm going for it because it's just too important. Like when you look at that ripple effect, it's very pessimistic. But this is my hope and I hope I'm alive for it. And I know I will be an influencer in it, whether the world likes it or not, is that this thing's going to develop like the smoking industry. So mm. if you, and we already know that it's, it's fleshing out exactly like that right now, but it took a long time. Like, I don't know if you know this about the cigarette, yeah. cigarette industry, like, you know, big tobacco, you know, we're fighting big porn sites right now. And, and, you know, I'm not in for the battle of it. I'm in for educating people one by one who educate each other, who start making change and we can create a ripple effect. But when it came to smoking, you know, everybody smoked and then people started getting an inkling. This can't be good for us. But then big tobacco did false studies saying it's great for you. And they kept putting out, this is great for us. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, secondhand smoke. And then oh, it literally took over 60 years for there to be, uh, you know, warnings and it's still not illegal, but the masses figured it out. You know, people aren't stupid. They're not stupid. I give people the credit that they, they have the ability inside them to see it. They just need someone to go, just think about this. It doesn't make any sense that this is good for you. They need a Morpheus, a red pill, blue pill, where they need Seriously, to like, hey, that's, that's why I pill. tell people all the time, come out of the matrix, like come out of the matrix and, uh, you know, be the person who can see it for what it is and just go, this ain't for me. I know like, and to have the strength to be able to say, when people go, you know, I watch porn, it's cool, uh, you know, and then go, no, it's not cool, because it's going to give you erectile dysfunction. And, you know, I've just become in my own personal circle, even though I've had things on internet, yeah. I, yeah. I don't say things, I've become more vocal in the people I know, because I know it freaks them out, because like you said, it's 99% of the people. So if we're out and people are like, what are you into? And a lot of people have seen my online stuff now, and they get all like nervous around me you know, oh, porn, huh? Uh, everybody says they don't do it and everybody does it. I'm like, not everybody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and, but, you know, I, but now I'm at the point where I'm okay with making people I know uncomfortable because it's for their sake, not for mine. And not, you know, I, there's no shame in it because I'm not a shame and judgy person about this, but it's like, that's why my message is it damages your brain. It impairs your, your mental and physical health. And this all substantiated. You know, so when people found out that cigarettes cause lung cancer mm -hmm. and throat cancer, like that's why erectile dysfunction is a really powerful mess message. And we know from the science um, that when people start to experience erectile dysfunction, if they can connect it to porn, which most people don't for a while, if they can connect that, it's a big motivator. 
And uh, yeah. one of my, a guy on my YouTube channel, AR is his avatar. He sent me a, a study the other day about a new study from taking data all off like Reddit sites and different sites about people who've decided to give up porn. And the number one factor was that they didn't think they could give it up. Mm. Then number two is they did not have the right tools. So then they kept failing. And once they were able to get the right tools and to do it, every person, like it's in the 90 whatever percentile, thought it was worth it. Wow. Well, let's go in that direction of treatment. I want to be cognizant of your time because I don't want to take it all up. But yeah, I think yeah, let's, cool. let's, let's go into the side of treatment. So people, you know, who are listening to this, which I'm going to guess 99.9% are thinking, <laughs> I'm into this stuff. Like, what's the first steps? Do I go to your YouTube channel or like, what yeah, can so I do right I now? I started making the YouTube channel so people have a free resource. But of course, like it's in my spare time because people get a little like, can't you organize this stuff better? I'm like, no. I have six kids. I have five teenagers, but I have six kids. Like I have six kids, two, two businesses, and try to keep my own relationship alive. So I put out videos every Monday and Wednesday at noon. Then I record a podcast every week. I put the video of the podcast out on YouTube also. YouTube is an amazing resource. And if you don't believe me, go on YouTube and look at some of the comments. People put comments all the time. It's become this, the coolest community ever if you need help because people are supporting each other there for free. And, and I just wanted to share, to go back to that study. The study shows there's two things that are necessary to actually come out of a porn use habit that's bad for you. Number one, the right tools. And that's what I give people. Every video has a brain tip strategy, I call it at the end. So you watch the why, and at the end is the how. And I say, go do this. And if you just start doing the things I say at the end of the videos, you may be able to come out from underneath this. Then in the community, people will share other strategies that they know are kind of endorsed by me from other videos, good advice. And people will, and I go on all the time, I comment all the time, you know, and people go, what do I do about this? I'll go, go do this. You know, I'll tell people in the comments what to do. So, you know, those are the two things that you need. And it's for free there on, on the YouTube channel. But then I offer programs at all different levels and price points because I'm here to help people. So my small program's $50. Thousands of people have taken it and I get emails every day that it's worked for them. It doesn't work for everybody depending upon where you're at. So I have a 30 day program, the 90 day program science shows that a comprehensive program yeah. that addresses a couple certain things that I'll tell you in a second is the way out forever. Plus having community or someone to share your struggles with. And in my program, I call it unwire, rewire and hardwire. So you have to unwire the programming of your brain that you've done for X amount of years. Watching porn is one of one piece, but we're programmed by our teachers, by our parents, by our religious organizations. We're programmed in ways that don't always help to come out of the screen. So when you reprogram, you unprogram yourself and you reprogram yourself, positive psychology, mindfulness, I use cognitive behavioral yeah. strategies. I use brain training with technology. So I unprogram your brain and we reprogram it so that you can act and think and behave in new ways. You have to set up new habits, new routines, and new thought processes. Then if you do those things, and this is really awesome. People tell me every week that with me, they've set up this foundation. Like they stopped thinking about porn a long time ago because I only address like the porn cycle and and I call it a pivot plan where you create a pivot plan. So you figure out how you're going to stay out of the screen and you make this plan and you have these strategies, you have these techniques for slips and relapses. But if you can stay out of the screen, then the work is creating a life you love, which everybody should be doing, but again, small percentages. So when you create a life you love, that's what you protect in the end. So what's different is you're not always, you're not forever trying not to watch porn. Mm -hmm. If you just keep your foundation in place, the thing that works for you, you don't ever have to worry about going back into porn because you're only going there to regulate your mood. So if you create a life that you don't have to do that and your brain's healthy, you've, you know, because you do have to unwire the, you have to fire up the frontal lobe, resensitize yeah. the reward center. This might be a can of worms, but I've been lit watching a lot and I'm an amateur in this field, but of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And I know psychedelics, they've shown this, they've shown that analogy, like the ski slopes that your neural pathways create. Psychedelics mm -hmm. essentially is like a snow powder day 
covers it all up and you create new neural trend like pathways. Has there been any data or any people investigating that way of curing these yeah, addictions? Yeah, definitely. And I think there's merit to that. And a lot of people I work with too are going for ketamine therapy, which mm. does very similar. So the way I see that is that's like a gateway. Yeah. And you know, it's not a solution at all because what it's designed to do, which is also a piece of my program, but like psychedelics could help to unlock that is to resolve past trauma and family dysfunction, which we all have. It's just a matter of magnitude and flavor. Yeah. So like when you take a psychedelic, it's helping to unlock what trauma and dysfunction does is it creates neuro rigidity. It locks your brain in this pattern. It's mm -hmm. the opposite of neuroplasticity. Mm. So like psychedelics creates this unlocking of neuro rigidity, which creates yeah. more neuroplasticity, but then it's what you do with that neuroplasticity moving forward. So if you go for a psychedelic experience, you've unlocked, but you haven't rewired and like, you know, done what you need to do in your brain to keep you moving forward. Got it. So there is no quick at home. You need to do this. It's a lot of it's going to have to be probably instruction of following this thing right here. This is what's going on and this is how to fix it and why kind of answering yeah, those. But in things. like my program, it's 15 minutes a night or a day when you learn something new and then mm. you implement it. Cause someone just emailed me yesterday, like basically I'm screwed right now. I need your help. I'm willing to dedicate three hours a night. I'm like, no problem. But good news is you only have to dedicate 15 minutes a night. And then when you do these things together, they work together synergistically. Yeah. And the synergy is what gets you out of it. Like that's why if people can afford my 90 day program is incredibly affordable compared to other people in this space on purpose. Like if you can afford a 90 day program that has all these pieces, if you start putting them together, like you have, the way I say is if you engage, you will evolve. There's no way you won't evolve. Now, do you evolve all the way in 90 days? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But in the 90 day program, I offer group coaching with me one time a week. Yeah. And that's where I get all the feedback from people where, mm. you know, this guy last week, he's like, you know, this program's done everything I needed it to do. And then wow. I've given him some advice on how to keep leveling himself up into the future. And he's been in it for 90 days. See, that's incredible. Well, Dr. Lay, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Yeah, no you, problem, you've right? given an ample of information to the listeners. And, uh, you know, I hope, keep, I hope people can see it in the lens of like, you, you become an alpha when you take responsibility and have the discipline to control these urges and control these have these addictions or addiction, that's bad for you. And not to see it from a sense of, oh my God, this is such a beta thing. Like to me, it's like, it's full alpha because it's that's strength. full control of your it body is strength. And, and it's strength to be able to go, you know what, this is the life that I want to create. Yeah. Talk about alpha. Who does that? Like nobody peak performers and optimal performers. And if you want to be an optimal performer in your life, and, you know, an easy way to think of it is like, you know, on your deathbed, what do you want to do? Think about how you've, you've stayed in comfort of seeming pleasure. Dopamine is the pleasure seeking neurochemical. It's not the pleasure. It just keeps you seeking. Mm -hmm. So like, if you're constantly seeking it, you'll be in a life of pleasure seeking and never getting to the end goal. So when you become, and I've had this discussion with multiple other people, like in the coaching space, like about the alpha you know, about alpha men, women can be alphas. Alpha to me is going, this is the life that I want. And I'm going to have the cojones to create it. I'm not going to allow myself to be sucked into distraction, whatever that thing might be. I'm not going to allow myself just to sit around wasting my time, damaging my brain. Instead, I'm going to gain the inner strength. I'm going to go get the work I want. I'm going to have a blast doing it. I'm going to find people that I like being with, and I'm going to enjoy every second and every piece of them in every way. And I'm going to do my hobbies. Nobody does their hobbies anymore. And if I could just share one more thing is that yes. back to our discussion on upstream, how are we going to stop this thing from creating mm. a tsunami? I've created a nonprofit organization and I began to raise a decent amount of money last year. And I intend on raising a lot of money this year for that very purpose. I'm creating a digital program with other people that I respect in this space. It's going to be a short one because you know how people's attention spans can yep, be, yep. but it's going to be a short, cool one that goes to schools, to parents, to other professionals in, in healthcare, because what happens is, you know, a lot of 20 year olds go to their urologist and say, I have erectile dysfunction. The first thing that should be asked is, do you watch porn? And it's not. So then the urologist will go, watch some porn. It'll help you be aroused. And I've talked to urologists about this bad advice because they don't know. Same thing with psychologists. There's 
teenagers who go to therapists, I work with a lot of them, 10 years for ADHD and anxiety, which is being caused by porn. Never asked if they watch porn. So I'm making a digital program that goes to those people, religious organizations. A lot of times people know they have a problem. They'll go to the religious leader who has no idea what to tell them to actually help them. So I'm creating this digital program and we're going to offer it out there for free to these people so that when they find out somebody that they care about has a problem, they know to tell them that, yeah, this is a problem and you need to get the proper help. And then either send them to my program or to other programs that would be a good fit to get the solution. And that's how we're going to go upstream. And if parents start talking to their eight-year-olds and stop their eight-year-old, like I'm trying to help Declan make better choices and to not take the path of objectification for the next 20 years, that's how you break this pattern once and for all. So I'm trying, trying to help people who are already sucked in and then go upstream and prevent the you know, kids that are, are being exposed right now from having that. Perfect. Well, sorry. Also, I didn't realize it was Declan. I said Decker earlier, so I apologize yeah, yeah, for that. Yeah, we, call, no, we call him that too. <laughs> and then um, where can people find your stuff? Yeah. So my, my programs are all at drtrishlee.com. That's easy. And then my nonprofits at pornbrainprevention.org. And there's a lot of statistics there. We have blog posts on both sites for more information. And uh, you, you can donate to Porn Brain Prevention. It's a nonprofit, so any donation is tax deductible. And you know you can know you're adding to the cause. And it's really cool because people on my YouTube site, on my YouTube channel, uh, one gentleman who I've obviously am very, very um, happy to say that he keeps donating thousands of dollars to oh, the nonprofit wow. because the YouTube channel has changed his life. He just did an audio testimonial for me and he's never joined any of my programs. Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. Just That's from so YouTube. Cool. And so he's donated a thousands of dollars a couple of times just because he got all changed his life on YouTube. So pretty cool. Wow. And then your YouTube channel is Dr. Trish Lay, right? Yeah, it's actually, I have two of them. And, and this is the, just the quick story was I've had a YouTube channel, Brain Rewire, Dr. Okay. Trish Lee. But then I made a video when this porn thing came at me and it's two minutes and 49 seconds. I actually watched it for the first time ever, like a couple of weeks ago, because I'm in the midst of writing a book, Porn porn Mm. Brain Rewire. Um, So trying to get it out there to people for 10 bucks, you know how that goes and have a a manual to help them. Uh, But I watched the video, it says like hardly anything, but that video, I made it and I put it on a new channel, Porn Brain Rewire, Dr. Trish Lee. And YouTube served that video up and I get a notification, you know, your video has been viewed a hundred thousand times. I'm like, what video has been viewed a hundred thousand times? Cause my brain stuff isn't that uh. exciting. And it was that video. So I started making consistent content a year ago, a year and change ago because of that. And so since then I've been able to help people all around the world. Wow. And if I feel like if I can recommend something that'd be amazing, I know people would do is if you start using the YouTube shorts and TikToks. And making, I know it require a lot of work and you have a family businesses, yeah, yeah. but within a 30 second video, you can describe something. I guarantee you if that gets in the TikTok algorithm, YouTube shorts, people are going to see that our age and they're going to be like, whoa, okay. Totally. That's, that is, that's the plan right there. And I just have to implement it because you're totally right. And TikTok, it's crazy. Someone reached out to me. The algorithm for TikTok uses eye gaze and is sucking kids into sexual material. Yeah. <laughs> and you know it's like it. yeah. bad news for society. So they're serving it up to the seven and eight year olds and then giving them exactly what they lingered on in terms of eye gaze. Oh my gosh. Well, Dr. Trish Lay, thank so we'll you so much. That. Yeah, you're thanks doing- for uh, chatting. It's been a great conversation. Obviously. Yeah, you're doing God's work. So oh, I really you. appreciate it. And I hope everyone listening right now will go check out your stuff. I'll link yeah. it all in the bio. So thank you yeah, again. Thanks. And if people need help, you know, even if you don't reach out to me, I encourage people to find the help that feels good to them because life's way too short. It's only a downward spiral or an yeah. upward spiral. There's no horizontal spiral with porn use. There's just not. You're going up if you leave, you're going down if you don't. And, you know, Let's start, let's start that upward spiral earlier rather than later. Perfect. We'll end it there. Thank you again. Yeah, Enjoy great. the rest of your day. Yeah, Take no care problem. of your Thanks. business yeah. and kids. Yeah. All sounds right. great. It was nice Bye. to meet you. Okay. Have a good one. Bye.